Now listen to me. In one moment, your entire eternal destiny is going to be fixed. Before you can even cry out, before you can turn your head, before you can breathe another breath, before your heart can beat in one shout, your entire destiny is fixed. Now you might want to correct my language and say, well, Brother Paul, no, your entire destiny will be determined. No, you're wrong. You're determining your entire destiny right now as you live. You are determining your destiny as an unbeliever. And grace is given to you that you could walk in rebellion and God not judge you. That you could be nonchalant and not care about the things of God and not care about eternity. And yet God does not judge you. Grace upon grace measured out to you. But one day at a shout, it all comes to an end. Before the shout is over, it comes to an end. And your destiny is fixed. What we're told here is that with the unbelieving world, it'll be like a thief coming in the night unannounced. With the unbelieving world, it'll be like the labor pains grabbing violently, grabbing hold of a woman and locking her in her place. She has nowhere to go. She can't turn to her left or her right. She can't make a decision to go in any certain direction. Right there is where she is. And where she will have to give way to the pain. In the same way you will have to give way when Christ comes. You know, so often we preach and we teach from this pulpit. But I want to just stop for a moment and plead with you. Before I start talking about the glories of the believer, I want to talk about you. There are at least some of you who do not know the Lord. And when He comes, and He will come, it's horrifying for the preacher to think that your soul will be forever Forever, forever damned. That is the plight of the unbelieving world. But when we look at our text, we see that it is not the plight of the believer. Now, the believer and the unbeliever have something in common. Both of them are ignorant with regard to the time and epoch of the Lord's coming. Both. But in those days, after that tribulation... The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven. And the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth his angels and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. The second coming of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we must live with a future focus about our faith. We must live with one eye upon the present day in which we find ourselves. We must live with discernment, with what is taking place around us. But with the other eye, we must always be looking to the future and looking to the horizon for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther put it this way. Martin Luther said, I have only two days on my calendar, today and that day. Speaking of the day of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Luther said that that day should have such an effect upon the way that we live today that he said, quote, I must live as if Jesus died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming back tonight. Even so, we must be living in a state of readiness and preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. It has been often said that many Christians are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. I want to reverse that and say, so many Christians are so earthly minded, they are no heavenly good. And a part of our being heavenly minded that we might be earthly good is keeping our gaze and our focus upon the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus wants us to be looking for his return. The apostles instruct us to be keeping our eye upon the horizon, looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We must never lose sight and never lose this hope of the second coming of Christ. See, so many people sometimes when I'm talking, especially on a university campus, and they go, I just can't see this. And they want to pretend that they're some sort of victim, but they're not. They're not a victim. And if you're here tonight and you say, I can't see this, you're not a victim. The Bible says, you know, you know, you know, but you're willingly blind and you willingly ignore. And because of that, you're not preparing for his coming. You do not fear his coming. You do not expect his coming. And therefore, his coming will come upon you like a thief in the night. Sometimes I wish that people could see what preachers see. When you look out over a group of people like this, you're not just seeing persons going about their daily lives you're seeing people who are eternal and will spend an eternity in the glories of heaven or spend eternity in the terrors of hell. Sometimes people ask, why does the preacher look so burdened? Because he looks at things in a different way. Every one of you, take note of this. This is not just another Wednesday night. Anytime the word of God is opened, it is not just another night. It is a night for you to seriously consider, do you know the Lord? Are you truly Christian? If he comes tonight, will it overtake you like a thief, like a trap? Are you born again? Do you have the assurance of the Holy Spirit? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? To whom do you belong? Every preacher half worth is salt. If if he could, he would grab you, tie you up, and drag you to the kingdom. But he can't. He cannot. No one can. Where will you be on that day when he returns? Where will you be? Will you be in the realm of darkness? Or will you be in the realm of light? Will you be by nature a child of darkness and disobedience and wrath? Or on that day will you be a child redeemed? And recreated a special work of God. Where will you be? Where will you be? We call it the rapture, and that's because of verse 17. The verb caught up, caught up, arpazo. It means to snatch up, to seize, and carry off by force. It is the sudden swoop of an irresistible force that pulls you away. So it is a violent snatching away. The term rapture is simply a word to describe the snatching away. And that is exactly what verse 17 is saying. There will be a time when believers are snatched up by a sudden, divine, irresistible force. That's what this text is about. It is about that event. Now let me let you know this is not when Christ comes back to earth. This is not that event when He comes and His feet touch the Mount of Olives and He turns the desert into a garden and He destroys the nations and He establishes His millennial reign. This is not that. This is not Christ coming to earth because it clearly says He comes and meets them in the air. We know this is also not judgment because there's no judgment here. There's no judgment in this event. Well, whatever this event is, it is strictly a snatching away of believers into the air to meet the Lord. Are you expecting, longing for Christ? I remember when my mother was dying and she had gone out and the doctors called my sister. I couldn't get there on time. And they called my sister. She was there. My sister who loved my mom, served my mom. She was such a blessing to my mother. She's sitting there 
And all of a sudden, thinking mom was going to die, mom came back to life. Kind of woke up, looked over at my sister, and went like this. Ugh. And my sister went, Mom, why did you do that? And she said, oh, I thought that this time when I opened my eyes, I would see Jesus, my Lord, and it's only you. It's only you. Do you long to see him? Do you? Or is salvation just some kind of ticket out of hell? Do you long to see him? Let's go on. In verse 4, he says, Brethren, you are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. You're not in darkness anymore if you've been born again. You're not in that realm of darkness anymore. Your mind and heart are not clouded with that darkness anymore. You don't know when he's going to come, that's for sure. But you're looking to him. You're studying His law. You're seeking to walk according to His commands. You're preparing your heart. You're cultivating faithfulness and godliness. You want to be pleasing to Him. So whether He comes in the midnight hour or in broad daylight, whether He comes in five years or five hundred, it really doesn't matter. Whether you know the day or don't know the day, that's not a big deal. Why? You're ready. You are ready. You're no longer in darkness. When Jesus came the first time, he came in weakness as a tender infant, born of a poor woman in a manger in the out of the way place of Bethlehem, unnoticed, unhonored, scarcely known. But when Jesus comes again, he will come with the armies of heaven around him and every eye will behold him. He will come in royal splendor, feared by all the tribes of the earth. He came the first time to suffer, to bear our sins, to be made a curse for us, to be despised and rejected and to be condemned. But when Jesus Christ comes again, he will come to take ownership of the kingdoms of this world and to rule in righteousness, and to judge all men. That in all this that I've tried to say, I've tried to say this, Christ is coming. Someone mocked me one time when I said that. Well, Christ isn't coming for a thousand years. I said, you're going to see him in less than 25. Because whether he comes here or you go there, it really doesn't make any difference. You're going to stand before him. Every day counts. Do you hear me? Every day counts. Every day matters. Every decision matters. Every time you pray, it matters. And every time you don't pray, it matters. Every time you listen to his voice and follow him, it matters. And every time you don't, it matters. Everything matters. And you've got to take this, not with a sense of dread, not in a way that is morose, but you've got to take it with a sense of solemnity and seriousness. This is the Christian life. You can't hit the replay button. There is no replay. Live each day. Yes, with, with joy. But also with a sense of seriousness. But this is the only life you have. It's the only life He's given you. And everything that you do here, everything will have some sort of impact over there. This is the promise of resurrection. God raised Jesus, and He will raise all who are in Jesus, even those who have died. All of us are linked to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We saw that back in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. The resurrection is this, each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ's at His coming. All who are Christ's will rise. The fact that they have already died and their bodies are in the grave does not eliminate them from this great event. This planet is a planet under judgment. It is under the judgment of God. 
And as I said, as we look around, we'll get in our cars, we'll go back home, we'll turn on television, we'll enjoy the many provisions of God's common grace in our lives. It just doesn't feel like it. It doesn't seem like it so many times. But be rest assured, this day is coming. It is a fixed day on the calendar of God. God established this day in eternity past. And there is nothing that will prevent the inevitability and the certainty of its fulfillment. And I believe that we are living in days that are far closer to this fulfillment than any of us may realize. 